France is growing older. That's good news. However, Europe's record-breaking life expectancy does have a downside. To pay for its increasingly healthy legion of retirees, the French right says there's no option. The retirement age has to rise from 62 to what the government proposes, 64. The left says if corporations pay their fair share of taxes, that more than sustains the country's cherished pay-as-you-go national pension system. On the eve of what unions bill as their biggest strike day yet against pension reform, what exactly does the future hold? The COVID pandemic offered a startling reminder of just how much productivity has soared over the years. Whether we're working from home or at the office, the digital age makes it possible to do a lot more in a lot less time. How does that alter our work-life balance? And more to the point, how much do we have to work to actually pay for those pensions? Today in the France 24 debate, do we really need to work longer? And with us, economist uh, François Giraud, researcher at the French Political Science Institute, Hi. Sciences Po. Welcome back. Thanks. Uh, welcome back as well to Monica Kesser, senior counselor at the Employment, Le uh, Employment Labor and Social Affairs Directorate of the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Thanks Good for evening. joining us. And uh, from Dublin, behavior scientist Dale Willillan is chief. Did I pronounce that right, Dale? So, so. Uh, Chief Executive Officer at Four Day Week uh, Global. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Sixth day of strike action since the start of the year Tuesday. This time, unions want to roll over the stoppages. Some have even gotten an early start. Here you see truckers at this roundabout. In the near the northern city of Lille, slowing traffic as they protest the raising of the retirement age. And with the government set to scrap special pension schemes for the energy sector, motorists filling their tanks early as they expect fuel depots to stop supplying gas stations. Kathy Kadir Clifford has more. Their goal, to bring France to a halt. Dubbed Black Tuesday, it will be a bumpy day for those taking public transport. 20 to 30 percent of flights are set to be cancelled, and major disruptions are planned for metro and train services. The French transport minister advised working from home where possible. Transport workers will be joined by energy sector employees, waste collectors and lorry drivers. Less involved in previous strikes, this time drivers are planning road blockages. As for the education sector, participation rates aren't yet known, but parents are already planning ahead, considering their options if the strikes continue. I think we'll have to team up with other parents who are in similar circumstances, who can't keep working from home and taking holidays. We'll try to organize who can take who on which day. Regular strike days have been held since January, but have recently lost steam. The government has refused to budge on its controversial reforms, which would change the legal retirement age from 62 to 64. Since January, the government is pretending not to see, or doesn't want to see, the millions of people on the streets. Some 1.4 million people are expected to take to the streets on Tuesday, a figure close to the participation rates for the earliest strikes. François Girolf, uh, you just a word on, on what to expect, because you you heard in that report uh, how uh, the last time around, slightly fewer numbers. This time could be different, though. Yes, I mean, at least that's what the unions are expecting or hoping for, is that this is going to be the massive strike that's going to make the government change its plans. I think that's like, it's clear that that's what they want. And so, yeah, I mean, clearly the action is going to be very strong tomorrow. The question is whether it will persist in the next few days and how long for the first time now they're talking about rolling over the exactly street. so that's the thing is that is that so going will to it continue? last all week all month exactly that's the question right and uh, this is in, uh, coinciding uh with the parliamentary calendar um some but not all of the this retirement package uh, which has cleared of uh, the national assembly it's right now in the senate uh, where they're due to wrap up debate before it goes back to the lower house. Uh, 
Yes, it's, uh, the, it's in the process right now. Currently, the senators are debating and putting their touches to, um, to, the, to the proposal. And so it's changing in, in different ways. But um, we don't really know what the final result of that's going to be. And then, in fact, it will go then afterwards into a commission, a mixed commission, which is made up of members of parliament and members of the Senate. And they will um, then have to hammer out some kind of compromise. Monica, you and Francois were with us back in January. Have things gone the way you expected them to? I frankly, on, on a personal basis, I would say I'm not very surprised. I, I think that that was to be expected because there, um, there's, there wasn't a lot of time of debate. And from the start, uh, the debate was very polarized. There were people who said, um, we absolutely do not want to see any change in the retirement age. And the government said that that was the principal part of the reform that, that, that was essential in their view. So it was actually to be expected with such polarized positions that it wasn't going to be easy to find compromise. And indeed, that's what happened, I would say. Uh, Dale Bouillon, seen from uh, outside of France, is this just basically a domestic squabble or are there implications beyond French borders? Um, well, I think pension ages and, and retirement age is not something that we've come across as part of our work in four day week global to date. Um, I think comparatively the companies of which we've done research in today's so retirement ages are actually quite high uh, relative to France. Um, and certainly what we're finding is that there is benefits to the reduction of working hours for everyone, for people, for businesses and for society as a whole. Um, and I'm sure that has implications then for health and well-being. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to, to, to that point, Dale, because it, it's important. How do you spread out the work? Uh, whether uh, you do it uh, uh, over uh, your working career or whether you save up uh, that time off for when you retire. Now, some stereotypes are true. The French do take more vacation than most, but they also manage to cram their work in before they go off on holiday. Uh, even after 2002 and the implementation of the 35-hour work week, productivity in France continued to rise and uh, even rise faster. That coincides with the rise of auto auto automation and, uh, and, and the digital age. And so uh, I, I, I'll, put, I'll, be, I'll begin with you, François Girolf. When you look at, the, at that chart here about uh, French productivity, and it's, by the way, uh, it's it's uh, it's actually on par with all the G7 countries and mm. and and the OECD countries. Yes. What is it down to? Why has French productivity continued to rise over the years? Well, French productivity is like you know most of uh, the rise of productivity is due to uh, to technological change, to the fact that we have improvements in in you know, in research and so on. And, and I think this has very little to do with how much you actually work. Like, and productivity here, I don't know if you are doing it uh, per hour or per person. Uh, I mean, it would depend, right? I mean, if it's per hour, of course, if we have less hours, you'd have higher productivity. Uh, but it's true. I mean, if you take the French model, typically it's like we have longer, I would say, weeks of, of work and more vacation and perhaps earlier retirement age. And the question is how you spread that over over the the whole life cycle, if you want, uh, and the question, and I think a lot of French people think that okay, they work really hard, but they're really looking forward to uh, being retired. And if you remove that from their, if you want, if you remove that from what they have, they feel they've really lost something. And I think that what makes it perhaps different for, from the other places that you can think of where people perhaps more think of their life as as they work but they work okay and they still have some time some free time uh, the french are very different they take the vacation very seriously and work very seriously as well and they take retirement seriously but and seen from abroad it's uh, this is the country of the 35 hour work week that yeah but you know 35 hour work week so first it doesn't apply really to white collar, uh, you, you, you know, jobs that typically work much longer than that. And if you take, for example, engineers, I mean, that's something I can compare because I've seen that in the US and in France. And I can tell that engineers work much longer hours uh, per week uh, in France than they do uh, in the US. And that's perhaps, you know, perhaps contrary to what people think usually. But it's not true. So the 35 hours is really mostly like administrative blue collar jobs, uh, but like a lot of white collar 
other jobs actually are not are, are not really 35 hour work week and on top of that very often people work longer than that and they get paid extra uh, to compensate for the fact that they don't work uh, this this short hours so it's not completely true you know pe people don't do the uh, the the working the working uh, day is not from nine to five like in some places it's more like nine to seven uh, for many uh, for for many people actually and that's very different Monica Kessler from Northern Europe where Working long hours is a sign that you're not good at finishing your job. Well, this is, it's definitely a very different um, culture, that's true. Uh, and it's interesting to see that in the Nordic countries, we often say this is due to the fact that um, people have more of a work-life family uh, balance. They want to pick up their kids. They, they stop work earlier. Uh, and there's a lot of support, government support. But France also has a lot of government support for, for children, for childcare, much more than, than in other countries where you actually have to work more in order to pay for the childcare, which is much better situation here in France. So, so it's a bit of a mystery because um, I think people do take work very seriously and they identify a lot with it. But at the same time, as Francois was saying, retirement is something you're waiting for, and and that's not typically French, no? because everybody, every country, you let you lower the retirement age, you give people the possibility to leave the labor market early. Everybody will take advantage of that. And how do you explain over the last quarter century this increase in productivity? Well, uh, as Francois said, it's not that it's not that unusual, and now it's become much much lower. It's a, it's a fairly stable situation in, in terms of productivity increases, which is something we observe in many OECD countries. So, um, but when one does when see that in in the in the prime age, the workers in France do work a lot, but then they stop early. So, if you take the average, then um, you have you have one group of very hardworking, high productivity. Um, workers and then um, people who leave the labor market very early, and uh, and that that's going to be hard to sustain over time. It's going to be hard to sustain uh, o over time um, with uh, increased automation. The fact that we have access uh, to information much easier uh, does that mean that the system is more productive and therefore generates more wealth and therefore pays for that pension system. Well, you have to see what could be the possible other effects of uh, of automation. And th this is something that we've been looking at very closely at the OECD, because um, not everybody's going to benefit from automation. Not everybody's going to become more productive. We will also be losing some jobs, because there's quite a few um, jobs that have a l very large content of tasks that can be automated. And that means that this person is not going to have a job anymore. So we'll have to find new jobs for these people. We have to retrain them. And that's not going to be an easy task. So if you look at it from an economy-wide perspective, it's not just going to be all easy, all gains, but you will have to have some major shifts between sectors to take care of the people whose jobs are no longer going to be necessary. The, f the Paris Metro used to have ticket punchers. Those jobs don't exist anymore. You now put your ticket in a machine. In fact, you don't even know if you have tickets more. Uh, it's more, not only the tickets, it's also the drivers. We, we, we have two fully automated lines already here in Paris, right. those so there's jobs more have, to come. Those jobs have disappeared, but those workers have found other jobs, have they not? Not all of them. In some cases, uh, some workers uh, have a very hard time. And specifically, if they're old, uh, older than, say, 45, 50, uh, it's much harder for them to find new jobs. Yes. No, that's that's definitely true. The, you can think of, and the question is how large the automation is going to be. We talk these days a lot about chat GPT, especially in France, but I'm sure like in all over the world, like the question is whether when even when you have a university education, many jobs will be automated, right? I mean, I, I'm not talking about the media, <laughs> perhaps, uh, here, but, you know, there's, there's a thinking of, of like, a lot of uh, press articles even could be written by, by ChatGPT. Uh, who knows? So, you know, the, uh, the automation, the extent of automation and the knowing what effects on the labor market it will have, it's true, you know, historically, we've always found uh, new jobs and new use for work, but what has been true historically need not be the case always, you know, I mean, economists tend to look at the past to try to understand in the future, uh, uh, I mean, it's true, you know, pe people have been w worried about automation historically always, and, and always uh, people have been wrong. Uh, but that doesn't mean that someday it won't actually happen and we'll need to share work. To share work. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing this is what... Uh, We're going to talk main, about with Dale. Issue. Let, yeah. let, let's talk about this, because uh, COVID has proven an accelerator for this, the digital age. 
A recent forecast predicts that in the coming years, hybrid work, that is working sometimes from, the, from home, sometimes from the office, will push up office vacancies by 55 percent in the United States. But it's not just working from home that's upending the labor market. In the UK, uh, a recent study uh, uh, that, uh, of 61 companies uh, done by uh, Four Day Week Global and others uh, turned into, well, a plebiscite. 62 percent of workers surveyed said the pace of work uh, had increased at the office during that trial period. But a whopping 78 percent said they felt as though the workload was the exact same as before the Four Day Work Week. Nearly three quarters experienced a uh, noticeable improvement in their uh, work-life balance, like at this landscaping enterprise near London. But I think what we weren't expecting to see was the so much was the um, the drop in absenteeism as much the, this increase in happiness, this reduction in tiredness. Because the thing we were most concerned about um, was this idea that would people become more tired and more stressed because they were trying to compress their hours, um, and that's not been the case. Dale Willeland, an increase in happiness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, I think the phrase that encapsulated our research was that it was better for everyone. Um, what we found was that 92% of the companies are continuing on with the, the four-day work week. And for businesses, they saw a 35% increase in revenue correlated with, you know, 71% reduction reported burnout, 39% reported lower levels of stress. So it's quite established, I suppose. Academics have been talking about this for a long time around how fatigue and burnout leads to, you know, lower productivity with individuals and how that can impact on business outcomes. And that evidence now is just becoming more and more established with with our research in four day week global. Well, I just to be just to be clear on this, because earlier you heard Francois Girolf saying that in France, the 35 hour work week applies more to blue collar jobs than white collar jobs uh, in, in your study. Who was taking part in it? So we had 12 different sectors, I think, um, involved across the entire span of work. And we've done other research as well within Ireland and the United States as well with planned expansion into uh, other continents this year. So we're not focusing just on blue collar workers. We're trying to see how this works in construction. We're trying to see how this works in, in the public sector. And luckily, we've been able to have partnerships with Cambridge University who have given us qualitative research and interviews, allowing us to understand how this works within some of those non-blue collar industries as well. And uh, what's been the result in terms of, uh, are those white collar workers as well uh, able to take that fifth day off? So what we found is that there's not a one size fits all. What our aim in Four Day Week Global is it's 180, 100. So 100% pay for 80% of the time for 100% productivity. But how your sector achieves that uh, is ultimately dependent on what your business needs. So what we saw was some people, um, some organizations taking their fifth day off work, some taking Mondays off, some having half their staff on Mondays, half their staff uh, out Fridays and then some shortening the work week uh, across the week to a 32 hour week. So working five days, but working shorter days. So wait, you're saying 100% pay for 80% work time. You're effectively arguing for pay rises. No, we're, we're maintenance of the pay for a reduction in the time. So based off a traditional 40 hour contract, um, 32 hours of work is what we're aiming for organizations to get down to. Does that amount, though, to a pay rise? I don't think so, because what we're focused on is, is changing the productivity metric from one that's focused on time and instead focusing on uh, productivity outcomes for the organization. And what we're finding is that many organizations are actually quite poor at defining what productivity looks like for them and have defaulted in the past to just time on task as a metric for them. So organizations now what we're seeing is have, they've done the work in defining what productivity looks like for them and they're seeing the benefits of that for their people and for their organizations. Monica Kessler, are you surprised? No, this is it, the, the, your question is very interesting. Is it? it uh, of course, it amounts to a pay rise if you work less for the same money than if you per hour. But what's also very interesting is to hear that the metric for productivity is a, is a different one. And I think increasingly we're coming to a situation, and and home offices helped with that also, where you define tasks and people need to do certain things in a certain time, and they're no longer under supervision, constant supervision of a boss at the office and so on. So so that that is an important point. But at the same time. Um, 
in fa France, actually, many, many women know the situation because there's many women who don't work on Wednesdays. Because um, Wednesdays is when the schools are closed and when there's no childcare, and it's very many mothers don't work. And anybody who's tried that know that on Tuesday night you work really late in order to shovel free your your Wednesday, and then on Thursday morning you you have a heap of emails to deal with, and and so uh, there is. And just to be clear, to, on the Wednesday, if you're, you're you on a four fifths contract, you don't, you don't get, get paid. You don't get paid. That's at eighty percent exactly. So so that's that's that shows you a little bit that you do have other stress points that you introduce. And I think the real trick will be, if we want such a model to work, how do we really reduce the stress and the work that, that's there and keep those times free? Because if everybody's on their phones on the free day and answering emails and phone calls and things like that, then, then in fact, we haven't gained that much. Dale Willian, did, uh, uh, were people able to uh, take a digital Sabbath on their fifth day? That was another interesting finding with our research, the qual qualitative findings from Cambridge University found that different organisations had different levels of protection of that work time and those who I suppose protected it quite rigidly also put in place uh, the mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, you weren't creating unnecessary uh, work for yourselves. So the way we see it is that you want to get to 32 hours of work. Like Monica said, you need to look at what processes and culture and leadership um, and other organizational factors that are inhibiting you from getting to that hour of work and also achieving that amount of work within those hours. Certainly what we're not trying to advocate for is longer working days within your four working days. Um, and I think Monica makes an important point actually, how women have been, been I suppose, um, disproportionately more likely to um, work a shorter week um, for, for gender reasons. Um, and what we're finding within our research is that actually um, parenting time by men more than doubled throughout the trial and that there was 62% um, reported improved combining of their work and um, non-work life as well. So it has implications as well for, um, for parenting as well. Monica Kesser. I think the happiness point is really interesting, though, because I believe that um, not just the sheer fact that you know that you have that extra day that you control, uh, and even if you maybe answer some emails, but the fact that you know that this is going to be your time and you're going to pre be free to organize this, that's a very important point from which we should learn for work as well, because we all know that work happiness, productivity, well-being at work is much influenced by the autonomy that people have in making their decisions. And that's why I'm not surprised at all to hear, even if it might be complicated in some cases to fit this reduced work schedule in, that people feel happier to know tomorrow is a day that is my day. And and, and maybe I have to work for an hour, but that doesn't matter because there, I can decide when I have to do that. Is there a, I'll put it to you, Francois Giraud, is there a generation gap here? Uh, you know, all this talk about how younger people uh, yeah, well, we don't want are, to work anymore. Don't <laughs> want to work or into experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, is this just a relation to work has well, changed? Is this just a stereotype of older people? I, I don't know about <laughs> that. I don't know if I'm old enough to <laughs> be able to answer this question. Uh, I, I think it's true that the COVID crisis has changed, I think, many people's relation to work in general. And I think maybe that's why we're having this discussion right now. Uh, it's interesting, you know, for economists, they are very usually there. You know, when you tell them that there was a hundred dollar bill lying on the ground and that no one was actually taking it, which is what you seem to be saying, that people could be earning the same thing, producing the same thing uh, while working much less. Uh, they tend to be very skeptical of that type of things. But it's true at the same time that, you know, are you skeptical of it? I. I I don't know if I think that in 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 all sectors. I'm I'm most surprised by the fact that it's true in all sectors. I would think you know more of a type of a, of the the type of jobs that you know are the white collar jobs where perhaps you know some some people take time at their at the office to. Uh, to check up the internet or things like that, but maybe when you are on a construction site and so on, I don't see how people could be as effective. So I'm more surprised by the uh, by the result on the fact that it doesn't depend on the sector. Dale, can you can you dispel Francois' <laughs> skepticism there? I'm sure. I think you know there is legitimate concerns in the sense that it is easier uh, implemented in some sectors than others, but that doesn't mean you that know, we shouldn't look at how this could be applied uh, in in those traditional sectors. Mm. I think one of the main things, and my I, my father works within um, service line industry, and a lot of the talk around lean and agile ways of working and trying to streamline processes, you know, 
things like reduced working hours and, and the facilitation of a, of a high performance culture can help enable some of the success of some of those principles in a way that hasn't yet been realized uh, in those industries. And is there a generation gap when it comes to attitudes about the work-life balance? Absolutely. You know, the emergence of Gen Z into the workforce is really shaking things up um, on what work is and, and the meaning of work. Um, as someone who's on the precipice of both being a millennial and Gen Z, you know, I can see how um, a huge amount of people my age now no longer see themselves setting into one career, but see themselves changing not just career, but sector two or three times within their work lives. So capability uplift in, in our age group is something that's a given. And I think alongside that, then people are expecting benefits associated with work-life balance, mainly because I suppose the benefits maybe that previous generations got for working hard aren't guaranteed for our generation anymore. Monica Kesser, is that not just simply the fact that you have less people in the workforce? I mean, people who were in the workforce in the late 60s told me uh, in those days you had a job and then when you felt like going off on a trip to somewhere, you quit your job and you came back and you found another job. Um, so. Uh, I think that that there is a generational change also because of gender gender equality, and I think we have a we have a really um, positive development that men want to be more involved in family life. For example, I mean, if you look at all of the OECD countries, there's not a single OECD country, not even the most advanced Nordic countries, where men do more unpaid work than women, and you know they start off young, very kind of balanced, sharing unpaid work and paid work and so on. And then as soon as people have children in couples, the, the, it explodes. Basically, the women have so much more unpaid work, and the men spend more time at the office to make up for the money that's missing sometimes. So, so if the younger generations now um, attach more importance to for men to take care of the children, to take longer parental leaves, that's really important. So it's not only about working time and productivity, it's also about gender balance. Because if we want to keep women in the workforce, which we urgently need, and not only for part-time jobs and a few hours of work, then we need more involvement of men in unpaid work because otherwise the circle simply cannot be squared. But again, we're heading towards this period of, well, what for France resembles full employment, which is what, 6.7% unemployment, which for us is like, hasn't been this low in decades. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking earlier about jobs disappearing. Is it really a problem? I mean, when you see that, uh, you know, again, it might be easier to change careers the way Dale says it in the future. Well, none of us know really for sure what the future is going to bring, but the challenges in the labor market are going to be great, and they need um, solid public policy to support them. Because we spoke only about automation, but think about the green transition. Um, what's going to happen there? We have to adapt to climate change. We have to. We have um, brown industries, which we have to turn into green industries. We have people who are working still in some countries in mining and in, in, in factories, and and so with climate change, they will have to go into other jobs. We we're closing down the whole sectors. And so that's a big challenge as well. So if we look at the future of work, it's it's we cannot just extrapolate from what it was in the past and kind of think the future is going to be the same. Also, Gérald? At, at the same time, we talk a lot about the fact that GDP will need to, to decrease, there needs to be degrowth. And so people perhaps think, OK, we're going to sobriety, so you know, now we don't care so much about having more things, but rather enjoying what we have and, and so on, and not buying two cars or three cars, uh, and perhaps having just one or even zero. Uh, and all of this, you know, the question of whether it's going to be more, more work for us to do, because everything's going to be less efficient, because the green transition is going to be costly, or whether, on the contrary, there's going to be less, job, less jobs and less things to buy and less things to produce. I think it's still kind of an open question be between people who think about green growth or people who think about degrowth. Uh, and I think, you know, very much all of this is very much open to debates. But for sure, the fact that the, the jobs will need to change, and in particular, the jobs that will be there in the next uh, 20 years, will not be the same because it will be more green by construction than the ones that there are today. So a lot of people will need to move and change sectors anyways, even if they don't want it. So it's a good thing that people have this in, uh, that that's, that's something that other people want. With shorter supply chains, will that mean you'll need more workers or less? So economists would typically 
basically say that this is going to make the economy less efficient and they would tend to think we're going to need more work and more people to produce things locally because now you cannot rely on cheap labor uh, from abroad, for example. Uh, but at the same time, you know, perhaps you're going to be more efficient in the things you produce, like not buy useless stuff, you know, from China and so on, not replace your iPhone every single uh, year or, or so. So, you know, it's a it's still an open question of whether but also the place that work is going to play is going to play in people's lives. Like and e even in the lives of the rich or the high income, like what type of distinction will people try to have if it's not uh, that they can afford more things than other people, you know, what kind of social, you know, uh, distinction are people going to be able to find? The reason why people buy uh, a big car is not that they need it, it's to also for social, you know, uh, distinction. And, and so the question is, what is this going to be replaced by something or, or not? I think all of these questions are very much open. And, and it brings mm -hmm. us back to our central tenet here, which is, uh, how do you pay? Here in France, we have a pay-as-you-go system. That means that uh, if you are employed, you're paying for those who are currently retired. Uh, and the question is, is it better to work less over a longer career or to work uh, right now uh, as much as we do and retire at the current age, which is... 62, the maximum, uh, uh, the maximum. Monica Kessler, have you done the math on this? Okay, so the math here is very complicated because we have a pay-as-you-go system, as you said. We're not saving money. So if people work more or shorter during certain periods, then you calculate at the time how much you, how much pensions you have to pay, and then you calculate the contribution rate. So you need p the pensioners are there and they're living longer. And the, the good news for France is that they have very nice long lives in in retirement to expect. And uh, of course, not all of the gained years are healthy years, but a, a large part of the years are healthy years. So you have to pay this for, for, the, long, for, for the long term. And, um, and if, you, if people become more productive but work less, you still um, you have higher wages, perhaps. But you still need many people working, because it's the sum of all the wages that, that pays for the, for the pensions, and not just a single wage. And as, um, and as we have French people grow older and um, and retire in greater numbers with the baby boom retiring. Um, we we will just have to find a way to get all those contributions in. And if not, technology won't come to the rescue, no, unless you would start using technology in in a different way, that you would start paying contributions. And all of these ideas have been out there. Um, I, think no, I, I think it's also a lot of this is going to depend on the accounting conventions that we take, actually. So how we measure GDP, especially when there's green growth, if we replace, you know, like a car that's brown that uses a lot of CO2 and so on by an electric car today, we measure it as if it was an increase in GDP because it's more expensive. And if you do that calculation, you will say we have growth. Well, in fact, we don't really have growth. We have inflation. And it, it's all going to depend on how we count things, because uh, actually the pension system is made up in such a way that when there's inflation, you're protected against inflation. But when it's growth, it's different. It's taken into account differently. So the sharing between the retirees and the workers will also depend on basically what national statistical institutes do every day, which is basically like accounting convention. So it might sound a bit... Uh, technical, but in a sense, uh, this debate is extremely important for thinking about growth. And, you know, we fight against, you know, is there growth or not? And very much, you know, when you replace a good with another one, a more green one, do you consider it's worth more because you care about the environment? Or do you consider it's just inflation? And that's something that we that we don't like. I think it's, you know, it's also an important debate. Paying into the pension system, Dale Willilin, is that something uh, that uh, uh, you think of at Four Day Week Global? And ha have you done the math in terms of uh, uh, w what's best, uh, uh, wor working less or more, or is it irrelevant? I think it's a it's an excellent question, and it's the first time it's come to our attention. Was really in the context of France's ongoing discussions with this. I think we're rolling out our pilots across Europe this year, uh, which will show us a lot more. Um, I think two thoughts that have come from the research, so that are of, of use um, from our qualitative research, we did find that people who found that they had more time were considering having families. Um, 
compared to um, when they were working their traditional working hours because they felt now they had space and opportunity to raise a family. So it has implications, I suppose, for future birth rates. Um, and then secondly, my background in behavioral science as well, I think, you know, when you can actually reduce the overall stress and uh, on burden um, on health of individuals, um, you know, there's implications then for when they might want to lock, work longer into their uh, into their age. So we shouldn't make it mandatory, I suppose, for people to work retire at a certain point work gives a lot of people purpose it gives them social connection and if people so, can so be- that's an important argument you're saying that uh, 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 a better uh, work environment is in a way preventive medicine and uh, will keep you healthier into your retirement years well stress is one of the leading causes now of, of health burden as defined by the world health organization and we saw rapid changes i suppose when it came to people's exercise levels and sleep levels and stuff like that during COVID, but stress levels remain quite consistently high and actually grew um, as a result of the blurring between work and life. So work is one of the major interventions that we can look at changing in order to influence those levels of rising stress within uh, the population. And I, so if we're seeing reduced working hours, reducing levels of stress, that will have implications for people's longer term health and their ability to work uh, beyond 62 years should they wish to do so. And just one final question on this point, Dale. Uh, when you unveil your study, how many people meet it by saying, oh, this is a victory for laziness? Uh, um, I, I mean, we certainly had that initially when we were having our conversations around launching pilots. But I think now this has become an apolitical um, topic. We've seen benefits from you know many sides of the political spectrum around how reduced working hours not just leads to benefits for people, but for business and for society as a whole. And just as we were mentioning there on sustainability, like work plays a really important role in regards to our future um, fight against climate change. And what we have found is that our, our participants uh, engaged in more pro-social sustainable behaviours. They were much more likely to engage in um, cycling and using public transport in the days that they weren't working. And they also, on average, commuted half an hour less um, across the entire period of the pilot as well. So it has implications for that as well. Right, and I'm haunted by what was said at the outset by François Girolf, the French work hard and look forward to that earlier uh, retirement when he recently visited the big Paris Ag Fair, which closed on Sunday. It's a, visiting the Ag Fair is a rite of passage for French presidents. Emmanuel Macron got an earful from an audience that's often up with the cows and does not relish the prospect of two more years on the farm. Macron insisted uh, that uh, he, the uh, uh, agricultural workers were not the target of the reform. I have an uncle who is 50 and is already blind because of chemical products used in winemaking. It's not normal. People at 62 will have a broken back. You break their back with this reform, sir. You will never have a broken back in office. But for the French who are working hard jobs, they will break their backs at work. Monica Kessel, your thoughts on how um, this reform is being sold to the French public? Well, I, I think it's uh, initially there was only uh, talk about the retirement age. And then as time went on, um, we got into a very interesting debate about work, about the value of work, about the difficulty of work. What we just saw in, in, uh, from the ad fair is, is precisely something that we need to be thinking about. Um, not everybody will be able to work longer. That's very, very clear. And that's not a polemic. It, it just means people have very hard jobs. Some people do. So you still need and, those special you, pension schemes, no, which is to say not necessarily. different retirement plans according to what trade you do? No, I don't think that that's the right way to go. And indeed, if you see OECD countries, most of them are closing down these special schemes because they're not very well targeted. Um, because you then say for an entire sector, everybody who's in that sector can go early when you really need to look at the at the specific conditions of people at their health. Because you shouldn't be asking people who, who have broken backs or who have other health issues um, to work much longer. So what most countries have done, because almost everybody had such special schemes, is to go more into a situation where you do more prevention, where you look at the medical situation of people and you decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether people uh, can still do something. This might be something that's totally different from what they were originally trained, and whether they, they are in a, also in a psychological situation to do so. So you need to invest much more in um, work medicine and, and make sure that you, you catch 
these cases and that you treat them adequately. I don't think that creating new special schemes is the way to go because we know that they are not very well targeted. So, so that would be the ideal situation to do a case by case basis, but who's going to be in charge of of knowing whether the person is actually uh, right for the job or not? Is it like a doctor or that sounds like a lot of responsibility uh, on a single doctor, like to decide, OK, you can go on, on, on retirement or not. So I think there are also some obstacles to doing things like that. But but I completely agree with what you said. So Macron said, OK, you can also change jobs if your job is really hard, you know, on, on you uh, from age 50 to age 60, you can just go to a different trade. Uh, it's not, you know, easy in all jobs, you know, to say if you're a farmer, then what what else are you, you going to be doing? It doesn't seem very obvious, but what I really find is that, I mean, I haven't heard to be honest, that discussion a lot in France. Uh, I mean, yeah, because the, the I big discussion say. the last few days has just been over the mobilization, whether Tuesday's strike will exactly. roll into Wednesday and Thursday, the but we not discuss, about the, the about content the of the reform. Yeah, we discussed mostly the politics, like, OK, how many people are there going to be? And I think that's a very confrontational uh, view. And, you know, I mean, each time I'm in a more international environment, I see that people don't think about these things. You know, the first thing which strikes me in this debate is that we say we. Uh, uh, while the French, you know, they think more, OK, if we work longer, that's going to be good for the corporations, that's going to be good for like a boss and so on. Uh, we don't think about what we want to do. Do we want to work more? Do you know what kind of discussion do we want to have? And I think that's the interesting discussion to have also, because because you, you heard Dale there saying that uh, uh, people should be able if they want to to work longer. Yeah. Uh, is that something you hear from the French? Uh, I mean, they can always, always be able to, but as you said, when you give people the option to retire early, they typically uh, will will take this option. And so the problem is that then that's a strain on the pay-as-you-go system. Either you let people go away with super low pensions, and that's not something you want from a societal uh, point of view, uh, and and or or uh, you know you have to force people in some way, and that's the way that the French have been doing it so far. And I think that's why it's so hard. But but I think that the discussion hasn't been really. Uh, going on, like even on the future of work, and there's a bit of a contradiction that we always talk about work sharing, green growth, like degrowth, and so on. Uh, and at the same time, we have a retirement reform which says we have a pension reform that says you need to work longer, you need to put in more hours, and people don't understand, in a sense, how the two things are connected. So I think we need to have more, more of an explanation of what we want to do. Do we want to produce more, consume less? Perhaps that would be. Another option. I mean, the France has a super large trade deficit. So uh, right now we are consuming much more than we earn. And if I was in the government, I would have said, OK, now we have a choice. We face a choice. Either we produce more or, or we consume less. And that would be more of a, of a trade off we have to face. Well, certainly a discussion of substance was had here. Also, as you know, I want to I want to thank you uh, so much. I want to thank Monica Kesser, uh, Dale Willeland for being uh, with us from uh, Dublin. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.